you know, is it gonna, can you see it on camera? The snow looks like glitter. I don't know if you can see it. It's a flurry, not even a snow. Day that last week's video is coming out, that's right now. I actually need to go upstairs and do some things to release that video. I, I should pick up, <laughs> can't speak yet, thought I should pick up and do a little bit of talking because I mentioned at the end of that video that I was going to put these sensors out here to measure temperature. So this is an outside temperature. I have a sensor on the inside. Last night got down to 14 and it surprisingly feels better than it did yesterday, which was in the video when I was outside doing these things. It was windy and rainy and I have sandals on. I haven't been out here very long. I'm not staying out here very long, but yeah, that's what was my point? I shouldn't have started recording when I haven't woken up yet. Coldest temperature in here was 33. That's pretty good. The 15 degrees, the two bags and the heat cables. That did the trick and down there, oh, it's so, it's so much sparkle from the flurries and the angle of the sun, the laurel hedge. I did have to come out and tie one of them up again last night because the wind had blown this one wide open. It unzipped it, so I zipped it back up and tied it closed so that it couldn't pop open through a sensor in there. And that sensor was reading only like a three degree difference from the outside sensor. Not a huge difference protection wise with those, but it kept the wind off of them, which is a huge part of it is just keeping the wind off of them to keep those drying cold winter winds from blowing all the moisture out of the foliage and killing them. Probably worth it now that the wind has died down. It's like six degrees warmer in there. So I think it was saying it's 21 or 22 inside of those. Well, inside of one of them. I don't, <laughs> I don't have sensors inside of all of them. That would cost a fortune. Everything else is good. Was worried about the wind. That was a big concern, but it looks like the bags held tight on top of everything. Needle palms, they're still wrapped up, looking good. And then the <laughs> perennials that I have over here inside of this thing didn't budge and it was extremely, extremely windy. So off to a good start. The real cold doesn't come in until tonight and tomorrow night. So we have to wait and see what happens. Should be dead. Chinese fan palms, usually when it drops below 20, they just wither and turn to goo. It's 114, and that's so looking, I mean, it's still got some nice green on the inside. You need to go potty. Go potty. Go potty. Hey, baby, how you doing? How you doing, Turbo? How you doing, Turbo? How you doing, baby? I cannot wait to get these plants out of here. It's only been about five days, but it feels like a month. Anybody else feeling that way? This cold. I guess just being stuck inside when it's below zero. I don't, I don't go outside very often. My plan had been that, you know, last weekend I did the whole covering up the plants, getting ready for this polar vortex, Arctic blast, whatever we're calling this extreme cold that's been going on. And then this week, I would be able to move the plants back out, not the mule palms. They're going to stay in here probably until March, but everything else, all of this, it was supposed to go back out. But a few days have passed, five days since that video, and uh, the forecast, as many of you know, because y'all live in the same country, a lot of you do, that there's a second wave. So they're probably going to be in here for a few more days. It won't be able to take them out until after the video ends. Which means there's just, I don't, there's not much I can do in this video. Uh, everything I need to do involves a ladder. I need to have the ladders out to get some work done over here and do some work with the lighting. But uh, the, lat the ladder's over there. See, I don't, I don't know. I just don't want to damage the plants. That's the thing. It's, I feel like I could maybe get it out here. No, I don't think so. Even if I could get it over here, I have to move everything off of these top shelves. I'm thinking what I'm going to do is I hold on. Should I back up and let everybody know what it is I was thinking about before talking about the plan? I've talked about it before. I would like to bump these shelves up just a little bit. This one right here, probably take it up to the top, allowing more space right here. Well, a little bit more space because I also want to bump this shelf up too, because the bottom shelf needs some more height to it. So this one would have a little bit more height to it, but not much. It's going to stay about the same. These will be closer to the grow lights up there, which they don't really need to be. Everything up there is doing fine. Same thing with this shelf. I can move this up some, but I don't necessarily need to because everything that's up here is doing just fine. I mean, look at all these flowers. You don't, you don't get those kinds of flowers if the plants aren't happy and if they don't have some good light on them. But I could use just a little bit more space right here and right there. 
but I need the ladders to do that. And also, because of the spider mites, which are, I'm, I'm not, well, they're not under control. I'm still spraying every week. If they were under control, that would mean I don't need to spray and I wouldn't have spider mites, right? But I'm staying on top of it, so they're not spreading rapidly, and I'm not seeing as many of them. So the spraying often is doing what it's supposed to be doing. But I don't want to jumble plants together. I know when they're this far apart, you think it wouldn't really make a difference, but just it seems like the smart thing to do is maybe get a couple more weeks of spraying in before I have to take all these plants off of these shelves and probably lay them on the ground over here in order to make room to be able to move those shelves out. That and once everything is out that's over here, once I have that stuff moved back outside, then I can scoot the mule palms over here and that will allow me to be able to walk around these corners again. I need to water. Look at those pothos, they're so dry, but it's just not that warm in here. So that's a bit of a catch 22, isn't it? And the coconut, well, that thing's been on the struggle bus. The other coconuts are doing fine. I mean, they could be doing better, but considering it's January and they're indoors, things are looking pretty good actually. But uh, that one, it, it no, it's not very happy. The point there is I don't like to water much when it's cold. Probably about 60, 65 in here right now. That's about the best the heater can do when it's, you know, minus 8 degrees outside. That's the coldest that it got. We were staying between 3 and negative 5 probably for about 4 days. Some of the worst cold I've ever seen in the area, but, it, you know, stuff happens. That's just the way it is. Oh, look at that. I'm seeing some floofy cotton-like stuff on the, but, oh, jeez, Always something. I wondered if that was going to be an issue because I can't spray the plants that are right above the water. So, going to need to move that. That's one of the reasons, I don't know if you noticed, but in years past, up until last year, I used to keep lots of plants right in this area. I stopped doing that because I can't really spray the plants that are in the middle. I can't have any of the neems or soaps or those things getting into the water here because there's fish and even when there weren't fish in here i have the humidifier down here or the atomizer that you know that thing creates vapor i don't want to be out here breathing vaporized whatever it is i'm spraying on the plants that seems unsafe have i deviated so far from whatever my point was that i don't even <laughs> i don't even remember what i was talking about anymore or what my point was anymore oh i need to water I need to water and then do some neeming. I like to water before I put down neem because it raises the humidity so the oil lasts longer on the plants. It can sit and hopefully work its magic longer. So I guess that that's what I, I don't know if I can, I can't water on camera. That's too much moisture. I don't ever do that in the videos, but maybe when I get the I don't know, I'm going to pick up and something's going to happen. All right, got the water flowing in. I have to use this water to make up water for the sprayer. If I use the water from the pond, then uh, it can clog up the fine tip at the end of the sprayer. There's a filter, but it's not, it's not the most efficient filter. Not by any means. That's the whole point of it, right? Because I want there to be nutrients and some stuff in the water. I think I'm going to mix this today at a higher ratio for disease control. So what is that? One and a half to two to three ounces per gallon of water. I'm doing that because I have all these palms in here that I moved in less than a week ago, you know, in last week's video. Putting some neem into the crown of those is probably a good idea. This has antifungal properties to so just trying to stay ahead of any issues might have with rot. Copper-based fungicide is usually my preference, but since I'm already doing this and I do need to go heavier with the neem this treatment than I usually go just because I didn't do it last week. I've been really good. I have been doing it once a week up until last week because I was outside so much. Yeah, I finished the bulb stuff like two weeks ago and then immediately it was just chaos outside getting things ready to bring them inside. And then I got the things inside and then, the, the, you know, life, other things were going on. I fell off, but it's okay. Getting back on right now, making sure to give this a good shake. Do y'all have a preference on your neem? I, the neem max is fine. I also have just used just regular old cold press neem, like the stuff from Amazon, or if I see it at a local nursery, I'll grab it there. I haven't really noticed this to be better than the others. Have you? I haven't. One thing I did notice is that the mealybugs are not listed 
on these like they used to be. Citrus mealybug is still listed, but not as many products are claiming to be able to get rid of mealybugs as there used to be, and there's a reason for that. They're getting very resistant to a lot of things. Even neem. It's not that they're resistant to neem. It's that the mealybugs have that waxy coating on them. They have a cuticle that repels moisture. So in order for something like neem to be really, really effective, you need really high pressure, which is why I like the sprayer, and or you need to hit them with some alcohol or some soap first. The diluted dish soap works really, really well. Nothing with any fragrance or too many dyes. Try and keep it as natural as possible if you're bothering with soap, right? Uh, but alcohol works really well. That's my preference is to just find them, spray them down, and then hit them with something like this if it's uh, one that's in a bottle that you buy from the store. But when I'm using the sprayer, as long as I have enough water pressure, it's usually good enough to do the trick. This is a fresh bottle, used up my last one, so that's why I'm making sure to give this extra shake. <laughs> I don't know if I'm supposed to, it's just instinct. It might even say on here not to shake it. I don't know why it would say that, because it's an oil. Shouldn't be much else in here other than neem oil and then whatever that other 30% is they're claiming down there. Probably some other type of carrier oil, something along those lines. Okay, so that's that. I'm going to give everything a light drink, heavy drink for those thirsty ones over there, and then pick back up, do some spraying, and just, I don't know, just walk around, talk about plants, and hopefully pick up in a day or two and go outside and... Maybe there'll be some updates to give. I don't know. Okay, I, I know. I said I was going to pick up when it was time to do the neem and I wasn't going to film while I'm watering, but it's not as loud over here. It's still pretty noisy from all the water flowing, but it's not as bad. Just a random thought. I said I was going to walk around and talk about plants. I think I'm going to have to get this mule palm, maybe both of them, but this one for sure, completely out of these containers this upcoming spring or summer, excavate as much of the soil out from the containers as I can and start over with these. Because the problem is, if you remember, they were doing great up until I repotted them into a pre-made potty mix that had a lot of coconut in it. And I know coconut works great for a lot of people, but it just wasn't jiving with the pH of my water and there were a lot of factors. I didn't like its moisture holding capacity. This mix that I use actually drained too well. This one over here, I took a lot of that soil out, managed to really pump in a lot of better soil in around the root ball. And it did well this year. This one over here, I barely have been getting any growth out of it and I'm just watching it. Look at how the water just like, it goes right through that mix. It's too fast. So the outer layer of soil, I think it's fine, but its root mass is still really, I think, surrounded by that old coconut mix, and it's just, it's not great. Oh yeah, okay, that stinks. Smells like neem in here. When I fill this, I usually put in like that much water, then add the neem or whatever I'm using, and fill it up the rest of the way. That's just dripping, letting the rest of the stuff drip out the top. Nothing like 90% humidity in steaminess and neem. It feels disgusting in here. Uh, I know, I know. A lot of people like the smell of neem. I'm not one of y'all and it's warmed up in here and <laughs> the temperature in here skyrocketed while I was watering because I turned the heater back on and looked and it warmed up to like 25 outside. Well, it's 25 outside, the heater at full blast make this place very warm. I shut that off. That's too much of a swing. That's not good for things either. And I do prefer to let the temperature drop just some, not a lot, three to five degrees when I water just because that's pretty natural for the plants and it helps with the VPD. That's the, va we, I don't, we're not gonna do all that. Shouldn't even have started on that. Are you done dripping yet? It's the only thing I don't like about these cups is the drippage you get with them. So it's like, hey, nice measuring cup, but then it just, it gets disgusting because of the oil. All I have to do is take it to a sink and rinse it out. This is what I use to remove the metals Chlorine, core means, and detoxify heavy metals. Might be necessary for you where you live. It's really not necessary here. I have never had many issues with that with my plants, unless we're talking about maybe Saracenias, Nepenthes, the uh, carnivorous type boggy plants. They can be really sensitive. But when it comes to things like Calatheas and Spathophyllums and some of the Dracaenas that we know can be more sensitive to chlorine, core means, and fluoride, I, I don't know, never been an issue here, but I have to use that regardless because there's fish in here. So 
I have to put a whole bunch of that in there when it's being refilled. And this does have a carbon filter that it's running from, but still, I like to put this in there to help detoxify the metals. I know nobody asked, just let now you know. Remember when I was talking about, I like the sprayer for the pressure. Look at this thing. Boom. That's fantastic pressure. With the neem, I just get into the crown, like to make sure that there's enough that it runs off of everything, try and get at it from all different directions. The same thing I would do with a copper-based fungicide. I just really like doing it with this particular sprayer because see how it has that angled nozzle on there? It's so good, it makes such a huge difference. It makes it so much easier to get into that crown and really make sure I'm getting everything down in there. It's also nice for getting the undersides of the foliage. I don't know if you remembered when I first noticed that there were spider mites out here, it was from this Musa no-no that I was repotting and I hadn't been spraying the undersides of the foliage very well. That just kind of tends to happen with plants in general. When they're indoors, it's a lot harder to get in there and spray the undersides of the foliage. But with that angled tip, look at that. I mean, you can't really see it from here, but this, look, look, that's so good really gets in there. Stand back further to really get up there. Clearly I need to pump this up some more. Losing some pressure already. That's the only thing about this sprayer. It has great pressure, but it also expels that pressure very, very, very quickly. Gave that a fresh pump and adjusted the spray. I had it in more of a stream to get into the crowns of those, but they really do better with more of a wide mist. Large droplets, but a wide mist. Does that make sense? I did, I did, there's nobody asked, I know. <laughs> Look at all that steam. It's not steam. I was using hot water. It's just moisture. Plants are letting everything off. Finished with all the neeming. One thing that I have to take into account because I use the concentration for treating fungal disease and not for foliar application, but I still did it for foliar application, is that I think it would be smart to come through here in maybe an hour or so and give everything just a very gentle light rinse to dilute what's going on on the foliage. I don't want to scorch anything, mainly the aeroids. And uh, I also need to make sure to go through and pull the plugs in these containers. You can see there's water in the bottom. Not much, just a little bit from when I watered. And I'm allowing that to sit in these for, I don't know, like I said, probably an hour. I'll come back out here and pull the plugs, let those drain out, and then give everything a very gentle rinse. I don't usually do it that way, but because it's a higher concentration, I think that that would be the smart thing to do just so I don't burn the foliage. Usually you have to use a lot of neem to burn the foliage, and I don't think I use that much, but just to be safe. It has smelled much more potent in neem -y out here before, that's for sure. I know that sometimes neem even gives me headaches and migraines, and it's not that, I mean, it's, it stinks. I'm going to have to change clothes and shower. I'm not going out into the world like this later on today because I'm going to reek of neem. But it, you get what I'm saying? I don't think it's that high of a concentration. But just to be safe, I'm going to do everything I just mentioned. The reason I'm going to allow them to have the soak is because the, you can also use neem as a soil drench. When you do that, it's at an even higher concentration than what I did for the disease treatment. But that will help flush out pests and things that are in the soil. And I don't have uh, many suspicions of soil-borne pests, but a lot of the mealybugs I have out here do congregate around the roots and then they move up into the plant. So it won't hurt to let things have a soak. It will help with fungus gnats and the uh, the pinch, those little pinchy guys that I have out here that I cannot stand them. I don't like them just because they bite. Like they actually bite me physically and it hurts the, what are, what are they called? I can't remember, earwigs. Earwigs. Lots of earwigs out here. There are a lot of different types. The kind I have that I don't see a ton of haven't ever done damage to the plants. I've had them around for years. They get kind of big. They're big guys. Not the worst thing to have around, though there are some that can be really detrimental and bad for your plants. Like I said, I figure just letting everything have the soak for a little while will help just cut back on some of the pests that are down inside the root balls of some of these. And uh, hopefully this made a big dent in any spider mites that were out here because I went really heavy with that name. Not necessarily the, con well, the concentration was heavy because it was the one made for treating fungal issues, but I really doused, went under and over and to the best that I could. It's one of those things, you know how that goes. Always miss something like the, um, what is it? One of these plants over here. Oh, this Dracaena over here. It's harder to get with the neem because the pond's underneath there. So I always have to pull it back and 
spray it and then let it go like and then shake it <laughs> let a lot of stuff drip off and move it i think i should just move that really it doesn't need to be there it's just blocking me from being able to water and take better care of things around the table let's put out some new growth I don't know if y'all remember, it wasn't looking good a few months ago because it had been buried underneath construction supplies and I didn't realize it. That's a whole long story, but it's recovered just fine. It didn't actually look that bad considering what it had been through, but now that it's putting out new growth, I know that I can move it. That was the whole point there. It is really gross and steamy in here. I'm going to let this get some more water in it. Things are moist and sticky and stay in that way, which is what I wanted, that humidity. It's nice and high, so the neem isn't drying up really, really fast. I'm going to come back out here in an hour, give a rinse. Up later. I would like to uh, get outside at some point and have a look at how things are doing out there. You hear that? Probably not. It stopped. That was the sound of ice thawing and water dripping through the gutters. It's the next day. And snow is melting. It's 40 degrees outside. I have on shorts, which is kind of dumb. I'm actually kind of chilly. Little reprieve from the cold. It's almost 50 degrees warmer than it was just the other day when it was negative 8 degrees outside. I don't really know what I was thinking. I don't. It, how am I. I'm an update. There's still bags on things. I can't take the bags off because we have a second round coming through tomorrow. That's why this is nice. Being able to sit outside for a little bit and get some fresh air, but. It's just, it's going to get cold again for a few more days, so I, I, don't, I don't know what I was thinking. I guess I'd have to wait until next week. And really, a full evaluation of how things did with this cold. I can't really even say much about that with evergreens until the springtime, right? Because they don't show a lot of their damage until they start to push out new growth. Depending on what you have when you're growing. The laurels that are down there, there have been my... They, <laughs> they have been my biggest concern those ones that are in the green bags over there because well, they were expensive and they're very sensitive to dropping below zero degrees. I lost that hedge last year, but I didn't bag it up or put lights in there. Looking at the sensors, it looks like that area inside the bags where I have, I only had one sensor for down there. So I have one inside the bag and one outside of the bag. Just the one on the very end, that's where it is. And then the one that's outside is over there by the light pole, pretty high up and exposed. And it looked like it was only staying on average like five to ten degrees warmer inside the bags at the most what really mattered to me is that the colder it got the warmer it stayed inside the bag so when it was down in the negatives it was still like two or three degrees inside the bags i think it may have gotten down to zero fahrenheit i'm talking at one point inside of those frost blankets which isn't great but they should be able to take a night of zero next year if the hedge has survived this winter, then I'm going to double bag them. There's a huge difference between using one and two bags on these things. Like the bamboo. The, you know, the bamboo. It's over here. That's what I ended the video with last weekend, was I was wrapping those up. I put two bags on them and had heat cables wrapped around the bottoms of them. And it stayed so warm inside those things that I really didn't believe that it was even that warm. I swapped the sensors out at one point to see if maybe one of them was faulty. I thought maybe I had set the sensor that's inside of the bamboo <laughs> on top of a heat cable, but I don't think that was the case because I then moved it and stuffed it like back into the bamboo where there's no heat cable. And it stayed like 15 to 30 degrees warmer inside of those containers than the outside air, which I was not expecting at all, especially because the heat cables never felt warm to touch, which isn't that unusual because when I was out here messing with them it was like minus five minus four something like that so wouldn't really expect to even be able to feel the heat on the outside so I don't I don't know we'll just have to wait and see that's gonna be the same thing with the sable palms I don't want to lift those bags up or mess with them when tomorrow it's supposed to be back down towards zero degrees I think maybe even colder I don't the forecast is all over the place it has not been reliable at all like how last week's video ended with me being relieved because the forecast had changed and the video started with me going oh it's gonna get down to negative nine that's gonna kill everything it's gonna be horrible and then as that video progressed the days progressed and the forecast kept getting warmer and warmer and warmer and then it changed to oh it's not gonna drop below zero and then the next night it was negative eight degrees. I'm glad that I went through and still did things the way that I would have needed to do them, whether it was going to get down to negative nine or stay around zero. It was just to be safe because you just never know what's going to happen. One thing I didn't do that I didn't realize until it was, I mean, I guess I could still do it, but I didn't wrap the little gem magnolia. I should have probably done that, but it's up against the house 
it saw negative temperatures last winter and it had a little bit of damage but not very much things do tend to be much warmer over there you can see looking at the garden bed over here the snow all melts from this point and over that's where it melts first it's nice and toasty over there of course where the bananas are not so much the case but right from there all the way over to this spot in the garden it's pretty toasty so you just have to hope for the best right i didn't think that it was probably necessary to wrap it up since i didn't wrap it up last year i think maybe at one point i maybe i threw a bag over it I can't remember. What's done is done. I doubt it's going to get colder than it has in this last week. Again, I hope not. There's a wall in my house. When it got really cold the other night, it cracked. There's a spot where it like squeezed the house together and there's a little crack in the wall now. Haven't been able to get the doors open because those have been basically frozen shut. It's not that they were frozen shut, but the house squeezed down. So I haven't been able to get that door open. You can get open, it's just very difficult to get it open. Uh, haven't been trying to not force it and just letting the dogs out in the front and when I'm able to pull it open, then they've been coming out here at the Labradors. Oh my gosh, they love the snow. It has been nice coming outside in the snow. It was very pretty when you could still see it, but now it's mostly melted. I'm sure we'll get more. And the gate, haven't been able to get that open until today, so I was able to move some more things around because that froze shut too. That was one of the reasons I wanted to get everything done when it was still 50 degrees out in last week's video instead of waiting until the cold front arrived. What I typically do just because I like to watch the forecast until the very last minute because I never know what's going to happen. But really, I think in the long run, it's better for me, <laughs> just psychologically and time management wise, to just prepare as if it's going to be the worst. And then if it's not, that's okay. Worst case scenario, you need to pop those bags open so they don't get too hot on the inside and the sun comes down and those that can really cook things. There have been years where I was like, okay, it's time to move in plants. And then I get the furniture mover and the dollies and gorilla cart lined up in the driveway and I go to open the gate. You can't open it. You have to go inside and get a tea kettle going with some warm water and come out and pour it over there until you can get it open. And that can break those latches. It's the end of that story. It was nice not having to deal with that. That's the end of the story. Oh yeah, still going to be a couple of days until I can, probably four or five days until I can move most of the plants back out of the garage and get some more space in there so I can get some things done. But it was nice getting a heavy dose of neem on things, just walking around and talking for a bit. The water, you can see that watering definitely needed to be done. But as far as stuff to do i like to do things in these vlogs there really isn't anything i need to do right now i'm kind of just at a sit and wait spot right now y'all saw the maybe you saw the last video from that etsy seller some people i don't think watch the entire video because i'm getting a lot of comments of people saying you should have asked for a refund you should have asked for a refund i'd call their credit card company i did it's at the end of the video i got a refund two hours of talking back and forth i had a refund they were actually very good about that their customer service was nice actually i'm getting a lot of that like people are yelling at me why why just watch the video that's fine it was a 20 minute video i understand people want to watch to the end probably not going to reply to the comments though where the answer is in the video just because of time's sake but i also got another box of plants in the mail and the entire thing was just mush it's from hertz i don't i don't why did they ship it out they're in ohio they shipped it out on saturday one of the coldest days that was in the forecast even up there for them more so up there for them i, I maybe i'm at fault here i don't know i just assume that they wouldn't ship things out from ohio when it's forecasted to be well below zero right does it just mean his shipping was really fast i'll give him that much better be considering how much shipping costs from them uh, but it was basically the entire order is just mush we can talk more about that and i have time to go through it and clean up the plants that might be revivable but they refunded the entire thing i feel a little bit bad about that though because i'm like should i have not placed the order should i have waited I paid for the heat packs. It looks like, the, I think there were two in there, so I think they threw in an extra heat pack, but you know, that's nowhere near enough though for sub-zero temperatures. I don't, I, don't, I don't really know who's at fault. I feel bad. In the future, I'm just not going to order from them unless it's nice outside, even though I feel like that's something they should be on top of since they're shipping plants just to be safe. I won't do that again. I really, I just assumed that they would wait a week to send the plants, right? wouldn't you think those big companies sometimes they just have a process they run through and they get orders and they ship them out and it's not like with maybe a smaller seller where you can check the f no that's not true I, I don't know why i'm trying to make excuses for them they shouldn't have sent it out i also probably shouldn't have placed the order 
now that I know I won't be doing that again. Waste of everyone's time and money and plants. A lot of those are dead and I feel bad about that. I would rather the plants be alive. What a waste. That's the update. I talked about the Hertz Warner last week, so that's what happened. They did send the plants. Most of them are dead. I, they None of them look good. <laughs> Some of them may rebound. I don't know. We'll see. Having to remind myself to pause the glider can make people motion sick. That's basically it, though. There's the updates. The plants are wrapped up, so I can't take them out of their bags because it wouldn't make sense. I'm going to have to rewrap them since it's supposed to get cold again for a few more days. But hopefully next week uh, we can have a better look at things and I'll put all the sensors up on the screen, the graphs, and have an idea of what was most effective. My prediction, the sables, sable miners that are over here, they're probably toast. Not dead, but I would be very surprised if their foliage ends up looking nice come March or April. They're probably going to look pretty bad, so they might be completely defoliated, but they should push out new growth. I'll treat them with fungicides if need be. Probably do it anyways, just to be safe and hopefully get some new growth out. You can see there's a needle palm right in the very front of this garden bed. I didn't even protect it. It's been there for years. It should be able to take it at this point. It'll have some die-off on it, but it kind of needs some die-off because I've needed to get in there and clean it out for a while and... It's hard to get in there because it's a needle palm. It's spiky. So I was like, okay, that's fine. We'll go ahead and just leave it and see what happens. I have one up here on the hill that you can't really see. It's over here. You're not going to be able to see it, but it's been there for years. Never protected it. Sometimes it has crown rotten dies back. It ends up coming back and looking fine. And yeah, I'm glad that went to the extra efforts, wrapped those things up. I even pulled some pots inside some of the bulb containers, which isn't ideal because with the bulbs, if you're going to take them inside, you only want it to be for like a day or two, right? Because you're going to spur them to start growing instead of this being a three or four day event like they said it was going to be this is now more of a seven to ten day event since there's another round of this arctic blast coming through so that's a long time to have bulbs in the house but even in the garage i don't know i don't think it'd be cool enough to keep them from wanting to break dormancy so we'll just have to wait and see what happens with those all right as nice as it is out here i'm gonna wrap it up because <laughs> we're in shorts i'm starting to get cold hope everybody's doing well thanks for hanging out we get to do some more activities next week we'll see it just depends on the weather and how much room i have in the grow space gotta be able to move things around in there to get some things done Thanks for hanging out. Hope everybody's doing well. Having a great day, a great life, and everything's just going absolutely beautifully for you. Pardon the dog poop. Toby, when it snows out here, he... Well, it's not even the snow anymore, but it used to be when it would snow, he would just go to the bathroom wherever he wanted to out here. Now that he's 13, this is Turbo, if you don't know. Toby, he's an old man. He's inside. Now he's just reached an age where he just... He just goes wherever he wants to. Some of these things are pine cones. It's not all dog poop. They were under the snow. The snow just started melting. I'm going to clean it up. Don't worry. I, I didn't even notice it until Turbo came over here and I started petting him that there was a pile of dog poop that has melted out from the snow my bad sorry about that of course as always and most importantly everybody oh you so sweet you so joy sweet turbo keep on growing baby